Okay, we're going to um, we're going to sit together for just a few minutes, and then you're going to have to listen to me <laughs> for a little while. Um, so we we did a little bit of concentration meditation this morning, and then we went to the highest level critical insight meditation already at the end before lunch, searching for the self that doesn't exist through feeling one's own sense of uh, righteous indignation uh, when you're not treated the way you deserve to be treated by someone who you love or who claims to love you. That's the golden opportunity for finding the self that uh, Buddha tells us uh, is not as real as we believe it to be. Um, the platform upon which that exploration rests is mindfulness. Um, mindfulness has kind of taken on a life of its own uh, in the past decade or so. Uh, and it's swept in, believe it or not, uh, believe it or not, for those of us who've been around for a while, it's swept into the mental health uh, world as a, um, a treatment modality of its own. Um, I think there's some danger in that uh, because just watching your mind and accepting yourself as you are uh, is a prelude to change, but it's not necessarily uh, uh, the vehicle for change just by itself. Uh, so I would caution uh, too much exuberance around mindfulness once it's discovered, but it's an indispensable tool. And uh, many of you here are already very familiar with it and don't need to hear me giving you instruction in it. But in case you're not, um, the basic difference from this morning from the concentration meditation is that uh, while we might start by paying attention to the breath or just listening to sounds as they come to our ear, to our ear door, uh, what we do in mindfulness is follow uh, our attention wherever it leads. So uh, remembering, as Bob uh, told us this morning, the, the mindful of the word, the English word mindfulness was kind of a, uh, a British Protestant uh, translation thing that got laid on it uh, at the end of the 19th century. So the, uh, uh, the Pali word is sati, which means remembering. So we're remembering to do something. What is it that we're remembering when we're doing mindfulness meditation? We're remembering to pay attention to this moment. You know, whatever is unfolding in this moment within the field of our experience, that's whatever is most prominent uh, we try to pay attention to uh, without clinging, without condemning, without holding on without pushing away. That's the basic mindfulness instruction. So you allow whatever it is to pass through your awareness, uh, noticing the difference between when your mind kicks in and tells you what's happening versus the raw sensory experience of what's happening. So you might hear a sound, and then your mind will say, oh yeah, that's a bell, or that's a bird, or that's somebody's telephone, or whatever. But the experience of the sound waves hitting your eardrum is not the same as your mind telling you what the thing is. So that applies also to inner uh, sensations or to emotional experience, especially from the point of view of psychotherapy when you start to have uh, emotional experience, anger or sadness or grief or joy, uh, often, uh, often the mind kicks in early and tells you what's happening. Sorry. Uh, often the mind kicks in early and tells you what's happening, and that actually takes you out of the, uh, uh, the physical experience of whatever it is that's happening. So with mindfulness, we try to notice the mind when it's doing that, uh, but then coming back to the raw sensory experience. So, uh, uh, do you need any more instruction than that? Any questions about that? So we'll just do that together for you know six or seven minutes. Um, okay. Uh, the same meditation posture. If you're sitting on the floor and you're comfortable that way, fine. Try to keep your back supported by the chair or straight. You don't need the support. Start with mindfulness of the breath, which is what we were doing this morning. 
So trying to find the breath or let the breath find you. Uh, you can use the word in on the in-breath, the word out on the out-breath, and remember the lips touching or the chair holding your body and touching, touching in that space between the out-breath and the next in-breath. And then kind of relax there as if you're getting ready to take a nice afternoon nap and uh, just let whatever is happening wash through your mind. Try to pay attention to it with alertness, but don't ride it too heavy. You know, let it really get the sense of fluidity, of change, of watching things as they change, not holding on to this or that. That's much more the, uh, uh, when the start, mindfulness starts to kick in on its own and you can just kind of sit back and watch uh, your experience like it's a, a film. Uh, and if you need something to do with your mind, with your thinking mind, you can use these mental notes or labels and rather than getting lost in the content, especially the emotional content or the thinking content. So if thoughts come, there's a way that you can watch the thoughts or you can watch actually the process of thinking and you can tell yourself, oh, thinking, thinking, rather than uh, uh, completely um, biting into whatever the thought actually is at that moment, which is probably a repetitive thought that you've had before. Mm -hmm. It's very rare that we have some kind of new original thought that we have to uh, actually pay attention to. If you do have one of those, great. Uh, but otherwise, just thinking, thinking, you know, warmth, cold, pressure, tension, throbbing in the body, um, sadness, anger, joy, whatever, uh, in the heart. Okay? Ready? Go. So if you feel lost and you're not quite sure if you're doing it right or what you're doing, you can always come back to the breath and center yourself in your attention to the breath. But if that feels, if that feel, if it feels safe to let go of the breath, then you can just see what else arises, even just the relative quiet of the room.
When when Bob was first starting out in Buddhism, his um, his teacher wouldn't let him meditate at all. I uh, know he was really frustrated. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Wanted him to learn why he was meditating before he meditated. Huh? Wasn't that it? Wanted yeah, to educate your mind. He came back to it later. I've yeah. been in India for a couple of years and I came back and I was meditating. He called me meditating. He says, Why are you meditating? I said, What do you mean, why? I'm a Buddhist monk. I want to enlightenment. He said, Oh, you can't attain enlightenment. You're an American. I <laughs> said, <laughs> 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 What do you mean? I'm a monk. I'm a yeah, but to attain enlightenment, you have to have a mind. Mm -hmm. And you Americans, you all think you don't have a mind. And we went on like in that vein mm, for a few more years. Yeah. Mm. Um, so I'm going to talk. I'm going to talk a, a little bit personally and a little bit theoretically. So if the theoretically gets too theoretical, then someone raise their hand. Okay. okay. Winnicott, Winnicott is Win here. I have Winnicott here. Oh, good. Yeah. Um, so I mentioned yesterday how lucky I was, I feel, to have found Buddhism before I knew much about anything else. Certainly before I encountered much uh, Western psychology or, or uh, Freudian-based psychodynamic psychotherapy. Um, I did eventually come back to Western Freudian-based uh, psychodynamic psychotherapy because even after uh, a big immersion in Buddhist practice and Buddhist thought and Buddhist meditation, um, I still felt like I needed something. Uh, um, I was still unsure, uh, which isn't an entirely bad thing, but I was unsure about who I was. Um, uh, I did, uh, right around the time that I first encountered Buddhism, I went to a uh, a therapist at the University Health Services, uh, who I met with three times to try to describe this feeling of uh, subjective um, confusion uh, that, that in those days I might have called emptiness. Um, and uh, uh, I began to unburden myself to uh, uh, this guy who was a practitioner then of what was popular short-term psychodynamic psychotherapy. And I met with him three times, and at the end of the third time, he said, okay, you don't have to come back anymore. But it's clearly like an, an uh, uh, Oedipal issue. <laughs> and, uh, and I was like, oh, really? Like, and, and I didn't know it had a name. Um, but he did, that's all he said. Uh, and I was not educated. I didn't really know what that meant. I knew it had something to do with my father. Um, but, and then he dismissed me, and I was like, oh. Uh, and then that summer, I went out to Naropa, I think it was shortly thereafter, and met uh, Joseph Goldstein and Jack Kornfield and got introduced to this uh, Vipassana, to the mindfulness practice. And um, I remember one of, the, one of the takeaways in those early days uh, from them was, you know, stop trying to figure out what's wrong with you, basically. Uh, through, with your mind and start to be more in your body, more in your experience. Um, and then the, and they taught me, I, they were each teaching these like uh, three times a week summer classes, you know, classroom classes. It was a real, uh, actually, re-education, um, learning what I hadn't learned at Harvard. Uh, um, they were teaching mindfulness, Vipassana, step by step, you know. Here's how to pay attention to the breath. That would be one class. Here's how to pay attention to feelings. Uh, you know, every moment of experience has either a pleasant and unpleasant or a neutral feeling tone. And there are meditations where you just kind of ride the feelings, like pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, mindfully aware of that, just that. Um, uh, here's what perceptions are, as Bob was talking about, when the mind kicks in and says, recognizes, recognizes what, uh, what this uh, visual image is. We know it as a table. We know you as a person, et cetera. Um, uh, the, the hindrances to concentration, uh, you can do a whole meditation on 
uh, uh, what the mind throws up to stop you from being able to concentrate. And they're traditionally given as uh, uh, sensual desire, anger, doubt, sloth and torpor, which is sleepiness that someone was asking about, and worry and agitation. So those are worry the, and flurry. Worry and flurry would be one translation. So that's what they do in Sri Lanka. Extra. Yeah, worry and flurry. Worry and flurry, sloth and torpor. <laughs> um, but we we might also say that that's ego. You know that that, that the ego is, doesn't want to give up control, and uh, so uh, when you start to create a channel, when you start to open a channel into a um, deeper part of your psyche, the ego throws up these obstacles. Uh, and the trick in mindfulness is to turn the attention on the obstacles so that the hindrances themselves, the anger, the uh, uh, sensual desire, the worry, the flurry, the doubt, the tiredness, actually become like the headache that I was talking about earlier, become the object of meditation. And you can use uh, those experiences, especially the inner aversion that you might have to these things that are getting in your way of your supposed goal, uh, you start to um, uh, bring the hindrances or the ego under the domain of mindfulness. So you, you expand the uh, what we might call the holding environment or the frame uh, to include those things rather than seeing them as obstacles. Um, so even through all of that, I, I still uh, ended up finding, needing and finding a different kind of therapist uh, from the short-term psychodynamic psychotherapy type who helped me a great deal in my late 20s and early 30s um, and uh, introduced me to uh, his therapist and teacher who was a Gestalt therapist in New York City who helped me even more. Um, that therapist started out as a poet in Berkeley and then uh, 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 went on to become a therapist himself, my first therapist, and I've stayed friends with him. And uh, he, uh, 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 he has introduced me to a great deal of inspirational uh, uh, reading from the Western side. Um, my book about desire, which was called Open to Desire, was really uh, uh, rooted a lot in a book by Ann Carson called Eros, the Bittersweet. Uh, uh, Ann Carson's a poet who translated from the Greek, and she translated a lot of Sappho. And uh, 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 the thesis of that book is that love or eros, sensual desire, which I claimed in my Open to Desire book, doesn't have to just be an obstacle, but can also be a vehicle. Um, that the word uh, uh, is not uh, bittersweet, according to Sappho, according to the Greeks, it's actually sweet bitter. <laughs> that the, uh, the sweetness comes first, but because it can't last, because of the suffering of change that Bob was talking about earlier, even the most pleasurable experiences leaves you a little bit wanting still. So that's the, the bitterness. So that was my, my um, way of talking about desire, the thing that the, um, thesis that ran through that book was that that gap that comes uh, even from our greatest pleasures can be a, a wonderful uh, a meditation subject uh, itself because it drops us back into ourselves where we're still reaching for something uh, that is already in us basically but we have to learn how to find it. So um, the other uh, uh, he's turned me on to a lot of good stuff. Um, another one being these poems by a poet named Kenneth Koch, um, who uh, I knew nothing about. I'm not really educated in poetry. I just read what he gives me. But um, I mentioned also that when I was young, I studied, and a couple of other people here uh, um, said that that, uh, that was true for them also. So uh, that was true for Kenneth Koch, and he wrote a poem about it, so, which I'm going to read you. Uh, this whole book is called New Addresses. He, um, uh, he writes each poem is uh, uh, like he's writing to the thing that he's writing about. So he, there's a poem called Too Stammering, 
where he writes about stammering, like that's the he's he's addressing stammering like it's a, a friend or an enemy or a lover or something. So he's like to life, to my father's business, to piano lessons, to stammering, to my twenties, to psychoanalysis, to Jewishness, to consciousness, to orgasms, to tiredness. It goes on and on to old age, etc. So I'll read you to stammering. Where did you come from, lamentable quality? Before I had a life, you were about to ruin my life. The mystery of this stays with me. Don't brood about things, my elders said. I hadn't any other experience of enemies from inside. They were all from outside. Big boys who cursed me and hit me, motorists, falling trees. All these you were as bad as, yet inside. When I spoke, you were there. I could avoid you by singing or by acting. I acted in school plays, but was no good at singing. Immediately after the play, you were there again. You ruined the cast party. You were not a sign of confidence. You were not a sign of manliness. You were stronger than good luck and bad. You survived them both. You were slowly edged out of my throat by psychoanalysis. You, who had been brought in, it seems, like a hired thug, to beat up both sides and distract them from the main issue, edible love. <laughs> you were horrible. Tell them, now that you're back in your thug country, that you don't have to be so rough next time you're called in, but can be milder and have the same effect, mm -hmm. unhappiness and pain. <laughs> <laughs> that was stammering? Stammering, to stammering. Um, and this is his one to psychoanalysis, which is... Okay. The one to Jewishness is great, but it doesn't really fit in the Buddhist. Uh, oh, but it's long. Yeah. I, well, let me Buddhist? read you to psychoanalysis first. Jew okay. Well, there's wait, one more. Okay. To psychoanalysis. I took the Lexington Avenue subway to arrive at you in your glory days of the 1950s, when we believed that you could solve any problem, and I had nothing but disdain for self-analysis, group analysis. Jungian analysis, Adlerian analysis, the Karen Horn icon, all other than you, pure Freudian type, despicable and never to be mine. I would lie down according to your dictates, but not go to sleep. I would free associate. I would say whatever came into my head. Great troops of animals floated through, and certain characters like Picasso and Einstein, whatever came into my head or my heart, through reading or thinking or talking, came forward once again in you. I took voyages down deep unconscious rivers, fell through fields, cleft rocks, went on through hurricanes and volcanoes. Ruined cities were as nothing to me in my fantastic advancing. I recovered epochs, gold of former ages that melted in my hands and became toothpaste or hazy vanished citadels. I dreamed exclusively for you. I was told not to make important decisions. This was perfect. I never wanted to. <laughs> On the hard, true surface of my emotions, your ideas sank in so I could play again. But something was happening. You gave me an ideal of conversation, entirely about me, but including almost everything else in the world. But this wasn't poetry, it was something else. After two years of spending time in you, years in which I gave my best thoughts to you and always felt you infiltrating and invigorating my feelings, two years at five days a week, I had to give you up. It wasn't my idea. I think you are nearly through, Dr. Lowenstein said. You seem much better. But light, comedy, tragedy, energy, science, balance, breath, I didn't want to leave you. I cried, I sat up, I stood up, I lay back down, I sat. <laughs> I said, but I still get sore throats and hay fever. <laughs> and someday you are going to die. We can't cure everything. Mm. Psychoanalysis. I stood up like someone covered with light, as with paint, and said, thank you. Thank you. It was only one moment in a life, my leaving you. But once I walked out, I could never think of anything seriously for 15 years without also thinking of you. Now what have we become? You look the same, but now you are a past you. That's 50s clothing you're wearing. 
you have some 50s ideas left about sex, for example. Mm -hmm. What shall we do? Go walking? We're liable to have a slightly frumpy look, but probably no one will notice. Another something I didn't know then. <laughs> it's good, right? Um, the Jewishness one is so long. Can you stand to hear it? It's really yeah. good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. To Jewishness. As you were contained in or embodied by Louise Schlossman when she was a sophomore at Walnut Hills High School in Cincinnati, Ohio, <laughs> I salute you. And thank you for the fact that she received my kisses with tolerance on New Year's Eve and was not taken aback as she well might have been had she not had you and had I not too. If she wasn't Jewish, she's saying. Ah, you, dark, complicated you. Jewishness, you are the tray. On it painted Moses, David and the Ten Commandments, the handwriting on the wall, Daniel in the lion's den on which my childhood was served by a mother and father who took you to Michigan. Oh, the soft smell of the pine trees of Michigan and the gentle roar of the lake, Michigan, or sent you to Wisconsin. I went to camp there on vacation with me every year. My counselors had you, my fellow campers had you, and Doc Ehrenreich, who ran the camp, had you. We got up in the morning as you were there. You were in the canoes and on the baseball diamond, everywhere around. At home, growing taller, you thrived too. Louise had you, and Charles had you, and Jean had you, and her sister Mary had you. We all had you in your Bible, full of stories that didn't apply, or didn't seem to apply in the soft spring air, or dancing, or sitting in the cars, to anything we did. In religious school at the Isaac M. Wise Synagogue, called Temple, we studied not you, but Judaism, the one who goes with you and is your guide, supposedly, oddly separated from you, though there in the same building, you and us children, and it on the blackboards and in the books, Bibles and books simplified from the Bible. How like a Bible with shoulders Rabbi Seligman is. You kept my parents and me out of the hotels near Crystal Lake in Michigan, and you resulted for me in insults at which I felt chagrined, but was energized by you. You went with me into the army, where one night in the foxhole on Leyte, a fellow soldier said, where are the fucking Jews? Back in the PX. I'd like to see one of those bastards out here. I'd kill him. I decided to conceal you, my you, <laughs> for a while. Forgive me for that. At Harvard, you landed me in a room in Kirkland House with two other students who had you. You kept me out of the Harvard clubs, and by this time, I was 21, I found I preferred kissing girls who didn't have you. Blonde hair, blue eyes, and Christianity, oddly enough, had an Afro-Adesiac effect on me. <laughs> and everything that opened up to me of poetry, of painting, of music, of architecture in old cities didn't have you. I was distressed, though I knew those who had you had hardly had the chance to build cathedrals write secular epics or paint enunciations. Well, I had David in the wings. David was a Jew, even a Hebrew. If he wasn't Jewish, you're quite something else. I had Lawler, Einstein, and Freud. I didn't want those three mm -hmm. then. I wanted Shelley, Byron, Keats, Shakespeare, Mozart, Monet. I wanted Botticelli and Fra Angelica. Fair, you've chosen some hard ones for me to connect to, but why not admit that I gave you the life of the mind as a thing to aspire to? That's, the, to, that's Jewishness talking. <laughs> and where did you go to find your freedom? To New York, which was full of me. I do know your good qualities, at least good things you did for me. When I was 10 years old, how you brought Judaism in to give ceremony to everyday things, surprise and symbolism and things beyond understanding in the synagogue. Then I was excited by you, a rescuer of me from the flatness of my life. But then the flatness got you, and I let it keep you, and perhaps of all things known, that was most ignorant. You sound like Yates, but you're not. Well, happy voyage home, Kenneth, to the parking lot of understood experience. I'll be here if you need me, and here after you don't need anything else. Here is a quality I have, and have had for you, and for a lot of others, just by being it since you were born. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
<laughs> it's good, they're all really good. Anyway, that's just by means of introduction to what I wanted to talk about. So, what I found was that what uh, psychotherapy, what that world addressed in me, um, and others too, I think, I, I, now I'm talking like the public, um, <laughs> uh, was uh, uh, our early uh, presumed childhood experience that we can't really remember, but that we assume our personalities, our characters are based on. And uh, especially the experience of the first five years of life uh, that uh, the uh, psychoanalysts, especially Winnicott, British child analyst of the 40s, 50s, and 60s who became really important to me as I tried to put these worlds together. Um, early childhood experience uh, within the Buddhist world is not really stressed, except in two instances that I, that I dug out of the Buddha's uh, autobiography, which I will go into in a minute. But uh, certainly as a therapist, and certainly from my own experience, whatever that feeling of uh, insecurity or doubt or uh, what the, uh, uh, the first uh, uh, therapist was calling the Oedipal issues, and he was wrong actually, I think they were pre-Oedipal issues, but, but um, we can talk about what that might mean. Um, uh, I felt like I was carrying something that I didn't understand, that in our way of thinking, the way that we are all conditioned to think by Freud and his successors, uh, I was rooting in my uh, early experience, blaming a little bit on my parents, uh, instead of taking responsibility for it myself. But um, uh, there was something important to excavate there, or to explore there, or to put words on, or to understand before I could uh, integrate it uh, into my meditation practice. And I found as a therapist that that's very important uh, for a lot of people, not for everybody. But, um, and I can tell you a little bit personally how that, uh, how my understanding of it evolved. I've written about this in a couple, I wrote about it in my first book, uh, In Thoughts Without a Thinker, and I wrote about it in this last book, uh, The Advice Not Given, because I didn't think my editor had actually read the first book, so I thought I, I could use it again. And I only have so many stories. But um, uh, when, uh, when I first met my wife, and we were really in the first uh, 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 flush of love, I would say. And I, this is post psychotherapy, and I felt really, you know, like I knew what I was feeling, uh, which was a a, a, a real achievement. Um, I, I started having a lot of uh, um, trouble sleeping, uh, and it, in a way, the uh, dropping off to sleep, as Bob was saying, is our greatest pleasure. There was some kind of fear in me uh, of going to that place and also of letting go, uh, I think, of her. Um, and that was not so good for an early, uh, for an early relationship, for the early part of a relationship, because it made me, you know, on the clingy, uh, hungry ghost side of love. Uh, and also, uh, you know, there was a lot of anxiety in me and therefore in her about, you know, uh, was I blaming her for going to sleep and, uh, you know, uh, that created a lot of problems. So uh, luckily I had this good therapist who introduced me to the poet, um, who, uh, uh, to whom I uh, brought my dreams. And my dreams during that time had the clue to what was going on because I kept, when I did fall asleep, I kept dreaming of my teeth crushing themselves uh, and, and causing me terrible pain. And then I would wake up like, uh, you know, with my teeth breaking in my mouth, uh, at least in my dream, not literally, luckily. Um, and right away when I was conscious enough to bring him these dreams, he's like, oh, that's oral rage. So what's oral rage? Um, oral rage, according to the child analysts of the time, Winnicott being uh, foremost, uh, um, 
children, babies, uh, you know, you have this first, um, first six months, nine months, uh, when uh, the baby is basically ruling everything, and then there's a sense of, uh, and then the parents of subjecting themselves as mothers biologically, and Bob talks about this wonderfully. I'll, I'm, I'm uh, uh, planting a seed to get him to talk about it later. Um, mothers naturally have a, uh, uh, an ability to divest themselves of themselves for the sake of the baby, and they put themselves to one side temporarily for the sake of the baby, nurse the baby from their own body, uh, wake up in the night for the baby, etc. And the baby, according to the, uh, the theorists, uh, the subjective sense of the baby is one of omnipotence. Of grandiosity that all they have to do is cry and suddenly the mother is there um, and then gradually there's a separation that occurs uh, and the mother begins to establish herself uh, as a separate person gradually and in a kind way so that the uh, the infant uh, starts to have to deal with his or her own sense of separateness and that's the beginning of what's called the oral stage of development where it's still the primary uh, erogenous zone is the mouth, and the baby is seeking the, the breast or the bottle or the comfort, uh, the oral comfort, not just of feeding, but of being held and uh, comforted and so on. And if the, and the mother has to not, uh, as time goes on, has to not appear like totally on demand or else she becomes a, you know, a servant forever of the baby. And, um, uh, Anna Freud, uh, Freud's daughter, who was a child therapist, had great stories of, because after the oral stage comes the anal stage, um, had great stories of um, uh, children who wouldn't go to the bathroom unless the mother stood in the corner of the room on one leg and sang uh, uh, um, uh, 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 a, a special song, uh, uh, like a... Uh, uh, I forget the song, I'm forgetting the song, but it's like a, a nursery rhyme, you know. Uh, so totally under the baby's control. You know? So that's too much under the baby's control. Um, Yankee Doodle Dandy was the song. Uh, um, so that, that separation is something I want to talk about uh, more. But when there's too much separation, this is the theory, then the baby experiences a very intense rage. Uh, and Winnicott talks about it as a kind of ruthless love, uh, and that uh, uh, a mother's main job is to tolerate the strong emotions that come during this time of separation, both the rage of the baby and her own uh, quote-unquote hatred of the baby that she manages to trump with her own love and devotion. And he talks about a, the good enough mother uh, with, and in those days it was mothers, now we would say any kind of parent or care, caregiver. But he talks about the good enough mother who's able to tolerate the, uh, the ruthless emotions that emerge in intimate relationships, uh, in love relationships, also in parent-child relationships. Um, and there's a lot to say about that. Um, once uh, my therapist identified this feeling that was coming up in me, oh, that's oral rage, putting the, uh, the words on it actually really helped me. Uh, and I think that's something that sometimes we don't emphasize enough from the Buddhist side when we talk just about tolerating the feelings and following the feelings in their raw state. Uh, it can be very useful cognitively, conceptually, actually to identify uh, some of what comes up that we feel is pulling us away from the meditation because my theory is that often these early buried uh, emotions uh, like my oral rage will come up not just in love and not just in dreams but also in one's meditation. They don't have to and if they don't for you it's fine but uh, there is a way to use them and to get to know them and therefore to get to know yourself by uh, uh, watching or following the kinds of material that comes up in your own psyche, wherever you are. So um, uh, at some point in my therapy conversations, I actually had the memory, and this doesn't happen often in therapy in my experience, and I'm not saying this needs to happen, but I did have the 
memory and it came through and I had more dreams after the teeth crushing dreams they sort of morphed into dreams where I would be trying to reach my wife or reach some other unnamed loved one on the telephone and instead of my teeth crushing the telephone would start to disintegrate while I was trying to uh, get it so they the um, means of communication for me was fraught. And I think you could see that coming into my stammering also, that the, you know, the tightening up of the voice being the vehicle that makes contact, um, that there was some issue there for me. Um, so after having a series of these dreams, I actually have the memory of my parents, well-meaning, uh, who had raised me to be a responsible older brother to my uh, younger sisters, uh, uh, leaving me while they, they were on vacationing on Cape Cod with uh, uh, friends of theirs who had the cottage next door. And they were next door playing bridge and had uh, rigged up a, um, an intercom in those days uh, so that uh, if I needed them, I could call into the intercom or if they, uh, uh, if anything was going on, they could listen. But they left me at the age of four, uh, babysitting for my younger sister, who was two. Um, and I think that maybe was a little bit more that I was a very responsible uh, child. And uh, much later in life, when I was writing my books and so on, and uh, people would come to my father and uh, they, they wanted to know, um, uh, you know, what kind of person this was who became this, you know, uh, Buddhist uh, therapist. Like, what was he like as a child? And, uh, and my father, like, my father tried his best to remember what I was like as a child. And, uh, and what he came up with was, well, he always did his homework <laughs> by himself. Um, so, you know, I was, uh, I was a good reader and, and very responsible to my younger sisters and, and so on. But, uh, inside, I think I was uh, uh, paying an important price that served me later because I got to have these dreams and these experiences and then write about them and it, it uh, made my career as a uh, Buddhist therapist. Uh, so I'm very grateful to them for all of that, but there was a little bit of suffering uh, that, that happened in the midst. So reflecting on all of that in my own experience, trying to bring you know, why I needed therapy in addition to meditation uh, brought me back some years ago, probably um, 15 years ago, when I actually, when I first started teaching with Bob, 15, 20 years ago. Um, kind of in the midst of a weekend like this, uh, Bob brought out this poem, an 18th century Mongolian Lama's uh, Enlightenment poem, um, which uh, maybe later today or tomorrow we, we can uh, uh, talk about a little bit. Uh, but he brought out this poem in a gathering like this for the first time, and it was in, it's in a, uh, uh, a compilation of his called Essential Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, and it's it's buried in the middle. It's not the it's not it's not forefronted in the book, but it's a, um, this is a Mongolian Lama's Enlightenment poem that's like an ode to mother voidness. And uh, he starts out the poem saying, "I, I was like a uh, how does it start? I was like a uh, a mad child long lost his old mother, never could find her though she was with him always." Mm. Um, and that I like immediately identified with uh, being the mad child, uh, mad, <laughs> mad, not crazy, but angry, you know, um, uh, uh, worried about the separation from the mother. Uh, and that, I think it was that, I don't know, all these things sort of happened uh, in, a, in, a, in a row, but um, uh, I went back to the Buddha's own biography, and I didn't discover it because it's well known, but n no one had ever, no one has made much of the fact that the Buddha's biological mother uh, passed away, died when he was a week old. Um, she 
gave birth to him from her side uh, and exulted in his um, shiningness um, and uh, then left her body uh, after a week. Um, and so this, uh, I was like a mad child, long lost. His old mother never could find her, though she was with him always. Uh, was this Lama's enlightenment song, but it also brought me, I think this is how it happened, I can't quite remember, but uh, br brought me to this fact of the Buddha's biography um, that had a lot of meaning for me, I think because of my own uh, early, I would say early, premature loss of um, uh, that kind of mother-child uh, uh, um, oneness, not exactly a oneness, but it's a, uh, a complicit, uh, 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 um, I, was always, I was a very responsible child and my mother had a couple more children and I think recruited me in a certain, I think she liked my intelligence, my mother uh, responded to my intelligence. Um, <laughs> And uh, and I was a help to her in that. You were the oldest, right? I was the oldest, yeah, oldest of four. Anyway, that's how I put it all together. Uh, but this um, uh, the the Buddha's loss of his mother uh, at the at a week old struck me as like why is this there? You know what's the what's the teaching here? And um, uh, so I I got it in my head that. Um, uh, I was going to do kind of like what Eric Erickson did for a young man Luther, it, you know, a, a psychoanalytic study of the Buddha, and I and I started uh, when he, he he did a Luther, and I and so that was the pivotal point for me: the loss of the mother. What impact did the loss of the mother have on the the young Buddha? Um, and long story short, you can you can read the. The, um, uh, the Buddha's life story, his father stepped in and his father married the, uh, the mother's sister. Um, and then they raised the Buddha with wet nurses and gave him everything. And, but the, he was raised in a, very, in a totally safe environment, 29 years in a totally safe environment in which uh, there was no deprivation. And then he married you know, and had a child uh, uh, his own age at the time. You know, um, when he decided he had to abandon uh, his, own, his own wife and child. So in a way, he replicated the abandonment uh, that he himself suffered, and then uh, tortured himself uh, after finding the, the two uh, uh, teachers that we heard about yesterday with, who took him to the exalted uh, uh, states of uh, neither perception nor non-perception, you know, total union, but uh, there was no absolute freedom in that union. Uh, he that came out of those states and then became an ascetic, a wandering ascetic, uh, tortured himself to the utmost extent, trying to free himself from the prison of the body, the prison of the mind, as if enlightenment was elsewhere. And then there's a pivotal event uh, in the life story of the Buddha uh, where he remembers himself. He's, at the, he's about to die from starving himself from his ascetic practices, and he suddenly remembers a boyhood pleasure of himself as a young, young boy sitting under a rose apple tree while his father was plowing in the fields, according to the Theravada version of the story. Oh, uh, um, the story got elaborated, so there are many versions of the story, but uh, he remembers himself sitting under the rose apple tree on a beautiful day, like one of these days, with the sun filtering through the tree. And uh, his father in the distance, but within visible range. So it's a, if you know Winnicott, uh, at all, who has inspired me a lot. Winnicott talks about uh, uh, the good enough mother who's able to leave her child uh, alone, where the child knows that she's there, where she's not, not intrusive but not abandoning. So the child has a sense of the umbrella of the mother, of the parent, 
that gives him or her the freedom to get lost in his or her own imaginative experience. And that's, that's the transition in Winnicott's language from uh, the oneness, the, the, um, the almost oneness with the mother of the early stages of breastfeeding and so on, to the uh, independent so-called self that can survive. Uh, there's this transitional time, this intermediate time, when the mother is in the next room, so to speak, but the child is comforted by that presence, but feels safe enough to go to sleep, or even not to go to sleep, but to go into his or her imagination, or into his or her play. So the, the Buddha, uh, under the rose apple tree, as a young, you know, as a, and I think, I think of him as an eight or 10 year old, but uh, I don't know what they, it's not specified exactly, the father in the distance plowing the fields, uh, the Buddha has a, an ecstatic experience under the rose apple tree, um, surrenders his fixed sense of self, and um, his heart goes out into the surroundings. And um, uh, the Buddha, before his enlightenment, when he's at the height of his austerities, trying to wipe out his bad self and uh, uh, go to an enlightened place that he imagines is outside of his body and mind, uh, has a spontaneous memory of sitting under the rose apple tree and having this joyful experience. And he's hip enough, curious enough, which I always find inspiring for my own meditation, and which I sort of want to impart to you, uh, he's not just going along in the doldrums of his meditation. He's paying attention to what arises spontaneously. And at, at the height of you know, his most ascetic practices, this memory of sitting under the rose apple tree, blissing out, basically, under the rose apple tree, comes to him. And instead of pushing it away, he turns his attention mindfully to this memory. And he thinks, huh, why am I having this memory now? You know, maybe this whole approach that I've been taking of privation, you know, of, of trying to get out of my body and mind into some imagined enlightened place that's other, maybe that's been heading me in the wrong direction. Maybe I've been going about this totally backwards. Maybe this, is, this memory is a clue. Uh, but, and then he thinks, but with uh, there's no way I could support that joy that I felt under the rose apple tree. There's no way this body deprived of nourishment, you know, at the edge of falling over. The descriptions in the text are really quite beautiful of uh, uh, how damaged uh, he had made his body. But anyway, maybe within this body, I could not support such a joy. Maybe I should take some nourishment. Um, and at that moment, according to the story, a young maiden uh, appears holding a bowl of milk and uh, feeds him as if from the breast. Uh, and he takes the nourishment and, uh, and walks for several days and then until he comes to the Bodhi tree. And uh, nourished by the milk and the food and the memory, he sits down under the Bodhi tree and has a series of, uh, uh, of very intense experiences that uh, lead to his enlightenment. But that, that moment, that memory, is the, it's the only time a childhood memory comes to my, um, uh, to my knowledge. Uh, and it's pivotal in the, in the Buddha's um, life story. Um, and I had the uh, experience while being uh, on retreat myself at the, um, at the place where I go on retreat, the Insight Meditation Society in Barrie. They have a, a separate retreat facility called the Forest Refuge. That's a, a place in back of the other meditation center where if you know what you're doing, you can go there and do it yourself. And I was there for a week, and they have a little library uh, that you're not supposed to go to because you're not supposed to read. Um, uh, but I would, I would go, no one's there. So I would, I would go in every day around 5 o'clock or so and randomly pick a, a volume off the shelf. And they have like the Encyclopedia Britannica there, which is the, um, the Buddhist sutras, um, which is as many volumes as the Encyclopedia Britannica. 
And I went in one evening in the midst of this, you know, reflecting about all of this um, before I had really written about it. And I picked one volume at random off the shelf and opened that volume at, at uh, random. And, and there was the only place in the, in the entire Encyclopedia Britannica of Buddhism where the, uh, the Buddha talks about this. Um, and uh, in, in, from the Pali. From the Pali, from the, the Mahavasa. Yeah, mm -hmm. where um, uh, he's talking about the, um, uh, why his mother had to die when he was a week old, because the bliss that she was experiencing with her baby was so great mm -hmm. that her physical form couldn't tolerate the bliss. So she, she had to take herself out. Uh, and what, and um, uh, one of the first things that the Buddha was able to do once he reached his enlightenment was go to the heaven realm where his mother was watching and weeping, uh, but watching him you know, pursue his, and he taught the mother the Abhidharma, which is the Buddhist psychology, taught, taught it to her. So that anyway, I found the one place where it's talked about. Uh, which I felt like, okay, was a stamp of approval in some way for my re, you know, doing a Freudian biography of, uh, or an Ericksonian biography. Um, anyway, so that all seemed very important to me, that um, the early experience is worth excavating, and that there's... Um, some kind of some kind of potential for joy um, that is already in us that we uh, uh, experienced uh, a taste of uh, uh, in that mother child you know early mother child um, relationship uh, that's like the prototype for the uh, enlightened experience that we can only try to understand but don't really know. Um, so I tried to make a, um, uh, a big deal about uh, that memory under the, of uh, the Buddha under the rose apple tree as a kind of uh, uh, key. I think it is it's talked about as the key to the middle path that uh, uh, we don't have to push away pleasurable experience, and uh, nor do we need to cling to it. We don't have to push away unpleasant experience, you know, uh, nor do we have to cling to it as the ascetic Buddha did. But the, in the middle path, we're willing to work with the entire range of experience, teaching ourselves not to cling and not to condemn. Mm -hmm. in, the, in, the, in the one you had as a youth, yeah. there's an element that I don't know if it was in that version of the story, of where he is upset when the father's plowing, yeah, because he's killing insects with the plow. Mm -hmm. So there's an element of, of uh, intensity of compassion that he has, and so he goes into the immeasurable states of the form realm, realm of pure form or pure matter where the Brahma sort of thing um, happens, you mm. know. So he reaches those, he does because of his exceptional uh, previous experience mm. in previous life. Mm. He goes all the way to the formless realm, to the realm of pure form, not mm. the formless realm, realm of pure form, of the immeasurable love and immeasurable compassion. So that fits with your, I'm yeah. just, I'm just at no, it's good. that fits with your feeling that he, uh, he, uh, felt that way with his mother for the brief period she was yeah. there and makes more credible to me which as you know i've been skeptical because the mother's sister was already a wife he didn't marry her she was already a wife mm -hmm. and she was right there they had many wives and so he as an infant he if you were to treat him totally humanoid way he had so many available maternal figures there that isn't quite like the the way that one becomes attached to a mother in the nuclear family mm -hmm. where there's just one mother there. It was more like that. So I was skeptical about it. Mm -hmm. But in a way, if you say that he spent some time 
and he was in almost the Brahma pure form reality as an infant, mm -hmm. just newborn, with the with the mother. So your your um, theory is more credible. <laughs> <laughs> I've been working on him for months. <laughs> yeah, there's something there. And also the Although it dangerously, oh, I'm so sorry. it dangerously connects with Freud's dumb thing with responding to that French writer yes, well, about well, the transcendental experience yeah. as being the oceanic experience of crawling back into the womb, which Freud imagined was a really pleasurable thing. Unaware of his mom, the mom eating like you know, like uh, chili con carne, and you're crying in the, <laughs> with the hot spice in the womb, you know, as the Buddhist describes the experience in the womb. So, it, in other words, it, that may be one of the reasons I was like, yeah, you know, about it, yeah. it connects to Freud's attempt to reduce, yes, the thing to just some sort of infantile thing, yes. Although, in another way, you know, the idea is that everybody does have Buddhahood in them right now, yes. And there was the Buddha nature, the super subtle mind, but it's inaccessible to us in our Buddha that we would normally habitually constructed. So then, in a way, the infant has less constructions around it at that at that time. You know? So, sort of unwittingly, not knowing what it is they have, they have a kind of a susceptibility to bliss, let's say. Yes. Okay, sorry, go ahead. No, it's fine. So, all of this somehow plays into Winnicott, who's been a big inspiration for me. This book, Playing in Reality, I don't know how many, I don't know how many therapists are here, um, a few. Um, anyway, Playing in Reality is, a, is Winnicott's big book. Um, it's a compilation of articles and so on. Uh, but it's in this book that he first outlines this idea of transitional objects or transitional phenomena, mm -hmm. that, they, that the baby in moving outside of the uh, imagined oneness with the mother uh, starts to uh, um, make use of an intermediate level of experience where it's not just the baby and it's not just the mother, uh, but there's some this idea of play or creative experience being something that is in the between, uh, and that this uh, ability to be in the between is, uh, in my way of thinking, is something that meditation also reopens us to. So there's a kind of learning that happens, a, a D, uh, what would you say, like a de-objectification of both self and other that, that uh, happens uh, in uh, any kind of creative experience, in, in making art, in making music, in, in meditation, uh, that Winnicott is writing about uh, the prototype of in uh, a kind of successful early experience, pre-Oedipal experience, the first few years of life that we don't really remember, uh, that we can't remember literally, but can, we can remember viscerally. So I just, this is a, the, probably the most difficult stuff uh, uh, that I want to present. It's not that difficult, just the language, you know, it's Winnicott, right, British Winnicott writing in the 40s and 50s. So you kind of have to get into the spirit of it. But I, I want to read you just a little bit of it because it, it tries to illuminate something that I feel is important uh, as we deepen our meditation practice. I think it brings the two worlds together in anyway. life. Um, so this is from the very beginning of this book. It is well known that infants, as soon as they are born, tend to use their fists, fingers, thumbs in stimulation of the oral zone, in satisfaction of the instincts at that zone, and also in quiet union. It is also well known that after a few months, infants of either sex become fond of playing with dolls, and that most mothers allow their infants some special object and expect them to become, as it were, addicted to such objects. So that's like the teddy bear, the blanket, and so on. There's a wide variation to be found in the sequence of events that starts with the newborn infant's fist-in-mouth activities 
and leads eventually on to an attachment to a teddy, a doll, or a soft toy, or to a hard toy. Even Bob had a toy like this. Do you remember? Do you remember your toy? Do you remember your teddy? My first teddy? Yeah. Not really. You had the name for it. You oh, no, well, that wasn't a toy. That was an imaginary lion that yeah. lived under my bed. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> called Richard. Called Richard. Yeah. Richard. Yeah. Yeah. Richard. Yeah. You actually called it Richard. It would send me to the kitchen to my mother or father and ask for milk and cookies because Richard wanted, wanted to. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. But I may have also had toys in the bed. It didn't matter. Sometimes it takes an imaginary form uh, under the bed. That's exactly. Uh, anyway, most of us had something like this. A blanket. I have introduced the terms transitional objects, this is what I got talking, and transitional phenomena for designation of the intermediate area of experience between the thumb and the teddy bear, between the oral eroticism and the true object relationship, you have to get, this is the psychoanalytic language, but oral eroticism, you know, like the sucking on the thumb, sucking on the nipple, the true object relationship, like a real person who you, a, a true object relationship in psychoanalytic language means a real person. Um, so and he's talking about the intermediary, something in between, like the imaginary Richard under the bed that's hungry, you know. So it's not, Bob wasn't hungry, but Richard was hungry. So that's the intermediate area of experience. So that allowed him to reach out to, you know, to the mother, to the kitchen, to whoever was in charge of the, uh, of the food in between meals so that he could feel connected in some way. Um, between primary unawareness of indebtedness and the acknowledgement of indebtedness. Indebtedness. Can you say that again? <laughs> between primary unawareness of indebtedness, that's the baby who, who uh, is not, doesn't know that the mother is a real person at all, just, you know, the breast appears and food comes, that's primary unawareness, and the acknowledgement of indebtedness, that's where, that's a stage that Winnicott uh, proposes where the child realizes, oh, the parent is a separate person who I actually owe some debt to, because they're, um, uh, downplaying their own needs for my sake. So, by this definition, an infant's babbling and the way in which an older child goes over a repertory of songs and tunes while preparing for sleep come within the intermediate area as transitional phenomena, along with the use made of objects that are not part of the infant's body, yet are not fully recognized as belonging to external reality. So you all follow that? Okay, so that the dropping, the, the pulling away from the mother, it's usually the mother, but from anybody, the pulling away from the parent before you go into sleep. And that's what I was having trouble doing, pulling away from my love, you know, and going to sleep by myself. You know, all my early issues around that resurfaced, like surprising me, right? So even though I had a, a intermediate uh, object, you know, I had a blanket or something, I can vaguely remember. Um, so he's talking about this transitional time, you know, where uh, uh, infants make use of either a real lion or an imaginary lion. Bob's a Leo, so of course his would be a lion. Um, that, that helps one navigate this intermediate terrain, okay? Um, so he goes on. Of every individual who has reached to the stage of being a unit with a limiting membrane and an outside and an inside, it can be said that there is an inner reality to that individual, an inner world that can be rich or poor and can be at peace or in a state of war. This helps, but is it enough? Now this was radical. This is like a Freud passed over this early time. Uh, of a child before, you know, Freud went right for the Oedipal period, which is age four or so, when you start to have a feeling from your own genitals and uh, there's a sexual feeling. Winnicott's writing about a much earlier time, uh, which is, good, to me, like super interesting. So an, an inner reality, and, you know, that can be rich or poor, you know, so. My claim is that if there is a need for this double statement, there is also a need for a triple one, the third part of the life of a human being, 
a part that we cannot ignore, is an intermediate area of experiencing to which inner reality and external life both contribute. It is an area that is not challenged because no claim is made on its behalf except that it shall exist as a resting place for the individual engaged in the perpetual human task of keeping inner and outer reality separate yet interrelated. So, you know, I think that's a lot of what we're doing in meditation. You know, what are we doing when we sit in silence together? We're, create, we're going inside, you know, inner science, the Buddha's inner science, we're going into that inner reality in which both the external sounds, world, and so on, and the internal ones are in, you know, it's a river connecting them. They're in the, they're not separate. They're not, you know, it's, so that, that intermediate area is one in which both, there's a flow that's happening between, between the two, separate yet interrelated. That's when it cuts language. Mm. I am here stri striking a claim, staking a claim for an intermediate state between a baby's inability and his growing ability to recognize and accept reality. I am therefore studying the substance of illusion, that which is allowed to the infant and which in adult life is inherent in art and religion and yet becomes the hallmark of madness when an adult puts too powerful a claim on the credulity of others forcing them to acknowledge a sharing of illusion that is not their own. Mm. Out of all of this, there may emerge some thing or some phenomenon, perhaps a bundle of wool or the corner of a blanket or a word or a tune or a mannerism that becomes vitally important to the infant for use at times of going to sleep and is a defense against anxiety especially anxiety of a depressive type. Perhaps some soft object or other type of object has been found and used by the infant, and this then becomes what I'm calling a transitional object. This object goes on being important. The parents get to know its value and carry it around while traveling. The mother lets it get dirty and even smelly, knowing that by washing it, she introduces a break in continuity in the infant's experience, a break that may destroy the meaning and value of the object to the infant. I suggest that the pattern of transitional phenomena begins to show at about four to six to eight to 12 months. Purposely, I leave room for wide variations. It is important to note that there's no noticeable difference between boy and girl in their use of the original not me possession, which I am calling the transitional object. Yeah. I should mention that sometimes there is no transitional object except the mother herself, or an infant may be so disturbed in emotional development that the transition state cannot be enjoyed or the sequence of object used is broken the sequence may nevertheless be maintained in a hidden way. Then he goes on to talk about the special qualities in the relationship. The infant assumes rights over the object, and we agree to this assumption. Nevertheless, some abrogation of omnipotence is a feature from the start. So the object gets, the, gets some power. You know? The object is affectionately cuddled, as well as excitedly loved and mutilated. <laughs> it must never change unless changed by the infant. That's why you don't take it away and wash the blanket or whatever. Or it's some parents, you know, worried about the children, like cut the blanket in half and then cut it in half again and then cut it in half again until finally there's nothing left in the, the poor child. You know, it must survive instinctual loving. You know what that is. And that's masturbating. And also hating. And if it be a feature, pure aggression. Yet it must seem to the infant to give warmth, or to move, or to have texture, or to do something that seems to show it has vitality or reality of its own. It comes from without, from our point of view, but not so from the point of view of the baby. Neither does it come from within. It is not a hallucination. Its fate is to be gradually allowed to be decaffected. De Do you all know what that means? Mm -hmm. Caffected is like the Freudian term for when you, when you put your love energy 
uh, into a person or a thing. So, so the blanket or the teddy bear, or in uh, the case of my ch one of my children, a, a wiggle worm, we call it, <laughs> um, get, it gets invested with all kinds of meaning. <laughs> and, um, and then uh, gradually over time, it gets decaffected. So you pull the, all that energy that you put into it very gradually, you take it back, and then the object is left just as a kind Sometimes of special The parent object. gets affected to it. Sometimes, yes. Often, the parent gets affected to it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that in the course of years, when Epat says, it becomes not so much forgotten as relegated to limbo. And there's a famous, um, uh, there's a famous parable in uh, Buddhism uh, called the parable of the wrath where the, the Buddha asks his monks, you know, what do you do with mindfulness? What do you do with meditation once you've crossed in the river, once you've crossed the river, once you've become enlightened? You know, do you carry the raft with you uh, forever on your shoulders, or do you store it in the, uh, you know, under the bushes by the side of the river that you've crossed? And the, the monks say, oh, Buddha, we store it by, we don't carry it with us forever, we store it by the side of the river. And he says, correct, oh monks. Uh, that's the parable of the raft. By this I mean that in health, the transitional object does not go inside, nor does the feeling about it necessarily undergo, regret, undergo repression. It is not forgotten, and it is not mourned. It loses meaning. And this is because the transitional phenomena have become diffused, have become spread out over the whole intermediate territory between inner psychic reality and the external world as perceived by two persons in common, that is to say, over the whole cultural field. At this point, my subject widens out into that of play and of artistic creativity and appreciation and of religious feeling and of dreaming and also of fetishism, lying and stealing, the origin and loss of affectionate feeling, drug addiction, the talisman of obsessional rituals, etc. It is true that the piece of blanket, or whatever it is, is symbolical of some part object, such as the breast. Nevertheless, the point of it is not its symbolic value so much as its actuality. It's not being the breast or the mother, although real, is as important as the fact that it stands for the breast or mother. When symbolism is employed, the infant is already clearly distinguishing between fantasy and fact, between inner objects and external objects, between primary creativity and perception. But the term transitional object, according to my Winnicott suggestion, gives room for the process of becoming able to accept difference and similarity. I think there is use for a term that describes the infant's journey from the purely subjective to the objective. And it seems to me that the transitional object, the piece of blanket, etc., is what we see of this journey of process towards experiencing. Anyway, if it goes, let me just read you one of the last little bit that I like. It is assumed here that the task of reality acceptance is never completed, that no human being is free from the strain of relating inner and outer reality, and that relief from this strain is provided by an intermediate area of experience, which is not challenged, the arts, religion, etc. This intermediate area is in direct continuity with the play area of the small child, who is lost in play, in direct continuity with. So for me, I think some of what we do in meditation is a recreation in adult form of that process that Winnicott is describing in healthy development of the inner child, where we, especially when we close our eyes all the way, but uh, I think even when we leave them open a bit, uh, we're creating this in-between reality in meditation where we're able to loosen the subjective hold of the, the self, you know, the I with a capital I, um, and melt a little bit into the flow of experience. And that melting that happens when we are willing to relinquish the uh, strong sense of self 
as also happens uh, in creative uh, experience, uh, in music, in art, and even in writing, in uh, sports, in with drugs, uh, you know, uh, um, that there there are healthy and unhealthy ways of loosening the uh, uh, the strong sense of presumed self, you know, that opens up a flow of experience. But I, I think in uh, at least some of what we're doing in uh, in meditation is reawakening this uh, uh, imagined early experience that Winnicott, it, you know, is so eloquent about. Um, so I have a couple of things that I think illustrate this a little bit. Yeah. What can we do for the person who didn't experience care in that first six or nine months of life. Yeah, that's all of us. We nobody got enough care. But some people got like well, some people got microphone. Sure. There you go. I just asked what can we do for the person who didn't get care yeah. in that first six to nine months. Yeah, that's all of us I'm saying. No no one got quite enough care. Winnicott is very good at talking about what's good enough. You, you know, so you're totally right. There are people who did not get what's good enough. And Win Winnicott, a lot of Winnicottian, you know, uh, his theory is about what happens to people who don't get enough. Um, and uh, they go prematurely into their thinking mind, is what Winnicott says. And they create what he calls a false self, you, you know, which is designed to keep out the hideous, you know, unfathomable sense of being dropped, dropped forever in those early years. So they create a kind of premature sense of security uh, in the mind uh, of a self that holds them in, a, in as good a way as they can imagine being held, but that leaves them kind of brittle um, and uh, scared uh, uh, and sort of prematurely together. So one thing we can do is to create through meditation uh, a re-experiencing of that early intermediate time where it's actually safe to let go of our presumed identities of the false self that gets created out of fear uh, um, and where we can start to relax the hold that our notions of who we're supposed to be has over us uh, and begin to re-experience the kind of flow that underlies uh, the mind's conceptual uh, approach to experience. And so that's true for everyone, whether they had the good enough early experience or not. It's especially true for people, I think, who were frightened early and rushed into a uh, uh, an identity, you know, that worked for a while but ends up being imprisoning. And I think the reason that I like to tell that story about myself, about my early experience in, in, with my love, uh, was that that love that I had for my, uh, for my wife, I have for my wife, re reawakened in me, I think, early experience of fear uh, that you're talking about. Not that my mother didn't do her best, etc., but uh, you know, whatever. Um, <laughs> uh, and it's all theory anyway, it's just, you, you know, just trying to uh, put words on. Uh, but that I think it reawakened something in, in me that then I had to learn how to be with, you know, that my dreams helped me, gave me language to not be just totally frightened, dropped as, um, when Winnicott talks about it, he talks about being endlessly dropped in the, you know, the, the fear of endlessly falling. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a floor there by the conceptual understanding that I could talk to my therapist about that, where I didn't have to lean on my wife to try to solve the problem for me. You know? um, so uh, I think that one of the things we do in meditation is create a safe environment for some people to re-experience uh, those early losses and the premature sense of having to be so together that uh, uh, afflicts many of us. And we learn, and I think that's when you go on a meditation retreat uh, at, at, uh, 
in insight meditation or even our time here in, in our little bits of meditation when you feel yourself slipping away a little bit and sometimes there can be a big uh, a rush of fear that comes it's nice to reflect that that fear might not just be a fear from now but might also be a fear from long ago that this is actually giving you a, a chance to re-experience and in a way to de, um, de whatever, uh, decaffect, destigmatize, you know, to familiarize yourself with a kind of fear that might have uh, existed when you were too young to tolerate it, but now that you were, you know, in your 20s or 30s or 40s or 50s or 60s, whatever, it's not like you can uh, you don't have to be the totally dependent uh, six-month-old, you know, who had to rush to keep herself together. So I think there's some advantage. There, uh, when um, Joseph Goldstein and Jack Cornfield, who were my Vipassana teachers, when they first started teaching these uh, 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 one-week, two-week, three-month uh, silent retreats, at every retreat there'd be a couple of people who couldn't handle it. You know, who were who were filled with a big rush of very very intense, what we would call pre edible anxiety. You know, where they just felt uh, they couldn't tolerate sitting in the uh, meditation hall because these kinds of feelings came rushing in, and they were too strong. You know, they, their whole psychic development had happened in order to ward these feelings off, and they had created what Winnicott calls a false self. You know, which is a sort of rigid self. Mm -hmm. um, that the, the Buddha talked about as the self that doesn't really exist, that we all to some extent create, but for some people it's, a, it's much more rigid. And then when the holes get poked in it in their first retreat and so on, instead of it being a, a rush of love, uh, like the Buddha experienced remembering himself under the rose apple tree, uh, it becomes a rush of fear. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the, the classic texts actually of the Vasudhimagga, uh, and so on. They talk about uh, um, experiences of both terror and delight uh, that balance each other. The delight of, you know, letting go of the false self, but the terror also that they compare to uh, the fear of being eaten by wild animals and so on. Rut maddened wild elephants and <laughs> wild hyenas as, as appear to a timid man who wants to live in peace. That's the quote from, from there. So um, it's not all roses, you, you know, you, you, get, you experience a kind of regression in our psychoanalytic way of thinking. The Buddhists didn't think that way in the early texts necessarily. That's why they uh, was like a mad child, long lost his old mother and never could find her, though she was with him always from the Mongolian Lama, touched me so much because he was using a early childhood uh, reference that you don't always see in Buddhism. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a, a way of re-familiarizing ourselves with our earliest experience that happens in meditation that I'm trying to talk about in all these various ways that I see as complementary to psychotherapy, relevant for psychotherapy, and helpful for psychotherapy. Because I, I think that the direct visceral experience of it, if you've been able to create a uh, good enough container, as I think we do in meditation. A lot of the concentration practices of meditation that we started out doing, where you keep returning to the breath, uh, building up what's called samadhi, but the power of a concentrated mind uh, allows you to hold the fears that come, the terrors that come. Um, and that's very important that you don't just jump into, as some people do, in, in their first uh, meditation retreat, that they don't just don't jump right into their uh, uh, pre-edible fears, but that they build up this uh, capacity that is there in all of us, latent, this capacity in the mind to tolerate disturbances. That's what the concentration practices are good for. They don't, they're not just for taking you away into a bodiless uh, state of mm. joy, but they're, they're there to create a, um, uh, an absorbent sponge in a way so that uh, difficult emotions, difficult memories, and so on don't have to sweep you away. But you can hold them. They're creating a holding environment. 
And that's what Winnicott talked about as, that's what the mother does. Uh, she creates a whole new environment. That's what psychotherapy does. It recreates a whole new environment. And I think that's what meditation can do. It, for those of us who need it, it creates a whole new environment. That's what culture does, which is where Winnicott's going in that. That's what music does. That's what theater does. You know, uh, That's what film does. That's what books do. They create spaces in which we can experience deeper aspects of ourselves, both the you know, intensely pleasurable and meaningful ones and totally frightening ones. And you know, what, the, what the Buddhists seem to imply and, and what a lot of the psychoanalysts, I think, have come to agree with is that if you're trying to stave off the difficult ones, that limits your capacity to feel the exalted ones. And that, that's why in, in Buddhist practice, we don't push away the unpleasant, we don't cling to the pleasant, but we train our minds to make room for everything. And in doing that, we can experience everything, including the most exalted states, which, which are educational. It's all educational. Um, does that sort of answer your question? Long answer to your question. I have another question. Yeah, go ahead. Wait, hold on just a I just, you mentioned that sometimes children don't have transitional objects, yeah. and it is the mother who is. Um, that sounds really complicated, and like, um, could you talk a little bit more about that? Um, sometimes people don't have transitional objects. Um, like, you could, uh, Bob had an imaginary uh, witcher under his bed, so that worked. Um, I bet he had some little something. Oh. Uh, what Winnicott's saying here, which I think is very, is really true, is that even if it's um, uh, even if there's no literal object, there's an imagined object. Um, so, uh, a, a child who successfully navigates separation from the mother is not clinging all the time to the mother. You know, has to be able in some way, it could be the smell of the mother, you know, it could be the inner image of the mother, you know, it could be the feeling in the room that is, you know, or the smell that's left, you, you know, and I, I don't think we have to limit our, ourselves to, uh, to, yeah, um, but the idea that there is this transitional time, you know, when the child can rest easily, knowing that the parent is there in the next room. You know, there is he or she cries loud enough. You know, accessible. Winnicott talks a lot about, you know, at what point, after how many cries, after what kind of time, if the parent doesn't come, then what happens? You know, that there's a, there's a period, there's a given period where it's okay, you know, where the child can comfort his, his or herself. I think in meditation what we're doing, not, I don't mean to reduce it to this, but I mean in a way to exalt it, that what we're doing in meditation is creating that kind of space for ourselves, where we can be with our fears, you know, where we can be with our anxieties, where we don't have to be staving them off, where we've learned how to be with the unpleasant, not pushing away the unpleasant, not clinging to the pleasant. You know, it's the clinging to the pleasant that brings pain because nothing lasts forever. That's the sweet bitter, you know. So what we're doing in mind mindfulness training is just all about that, not clinging to the pleasant, not pushing away the unpleasant. And that is creating a kind of transitional experience for ourselves where we learn that we can tolerate ourselves you know we can tolerate experience be, uh, better than we thought we could so instead of staving off reality you know by trying to control it which you know and then obsessional rituals and so on that's the ultimate in trying to control reality you know if i repeat and in a way mantra and so on there's an obsessional quality even to mantra where we're uh, so that's being put to use. I'm not saying, you know, we have to put all this to use for ourselves. 
there's an obsessive compulsive aspect to meditation, you, you know, counting the breath, um, uh, etc. Every, you know, but it's in the service of this open. That's why it, it uh, it's nice to take meditation to its uh, most open, uh, um, uh, you know, objectless experience where. All the flow of it's your one with the flow of experience that's like a liberating why is that liberating you know so um, with, it's helping us to move away from the fixation you, you know on self and other where if we navigate this like reasonably well the growing up and okay I have a self I'm not crazy I know the difference between me and you you, you know but then there's this all this loosening of the boundaries that actually when we go to sleep, when we're creating, when we're reading, even in the movies, you, you know, when we're listening to music, when we're meditating, there's so much time in life when we're fed by this underground river, you know, where we don't have to be the fixed self that we think we have to be. So being able to be fluid between, you know, that's the experience that uh, I think meditation is opening for us. That Win Winnicott loves that. Winnicott's all about, you know, like that's important for a self. You know, the self that we that psychology imagines is not the self that Winnicott imagines. So, and I think that meditation has come in for many of us. You know, brought up with a hundred years of uh, of Freudian psychotherapy in the background. Meditation has come in as a kind of corrective, and it's come as a corrective for therapists also. You know, th we therapists need it because the, the fixed sense of self that we're thought, you know brought up thinking we need is is still is still uncomfortable. You know, so mm -hmm. the, and and Winnicott's very good about that about creativity, um, uh, creativity as a kind of religious, a kind of mystical experience, and the. The place of that in a in a whole life, you know. So, um, I want to read you a couple of things that speak to that in a different way. I guess we, we're stopping at six, right? So I'm going. Is there a going on? So her. Um, this is from a, um, a, psycho, a psychologist at the New School uh, in Manhattan named Jeremy Safran, um, who wrote a book called Buddhism and Psychoanalysis. Who unfortunately was murdered last year? Oh my God! Yeah, murdered in his murdered? in his house in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. protecting his daughter from uh, somebody who broke him. Wow. In New York. Yeah. Um, my Tibetan teacher, he writes, Karma Tinley Rinpoche, once asked me in his broken, heavily accented English, "How does Western psychology treat nervousness?" Why do you ask? I responded. Well, he replied, I've always been a nervous person. Even when I was a little boy, I was nervous, and I still am. Especially when I have to talk to large groups of people or to people I don't know, I get nervous. As was often the case with the questions that Karma Tinley asked me, I found myself drawing a complete blank. Part of it was the difficulty of trying to find the words to explain something to somebody whose grasp of English was limited. But there was another more important factor. On the face of it, this was a simple question. But Karma Tinley was a highly respected Lama, now in his 60s, who had spent years mastering the most sophisticated Tibetan Buddhist meditation techniques. Those who knew Karma Tinley considered him to be an enlightened being. In the West, psychotherapists are increasingly turning to Buddhist meditation as a valuable treatment for a variety of problems, including anxiety. Who was I to tell him how to deal with anxiety? And how was it possible that Karma Tinley, with all of his experience meditating, could still be troubled by such everyday concerns? How could an enlightened person be socially anxious? Was he really enlightened? What does it mean to be enlightened? My head swirled with all of these inchoate questions, and for a moment my mind stopped. I felt a sense of warmth coming from Karma Tinley, and I felt warmly towards him, I felt young, soft, open, and uncertain about everything I knew. Ah. Young, soft, open, and uncertain. 
about everything I know. So that's the, you know, in my mind, that's the uh, transitional experience coming again. You, you know, like we think we have what, to. What did he decide? Or he never decided yeah. anything about whether he was while he was nervous or anything. <laughs> I mean, in the book, I'm just saying. In, in the book, this is the best part of the book. Then the book is like um, uh, psychotherapists writing about how Buddhism. Uh, help them and uh, Buddhist teachers writing about psychotherapy and it doesn't really go where it should go. Um, oh. So I think that uh, this to me was the best. Uh, but, but I'm saying he's wondering, is he really enlightened? But he, does, so he doesn't Enlightenment about, includes he doesn't your the solution to that issue. The solution is you don't have to set enlightenment up. Right. It's opposite. You don't have to set them up as polarities. That you could be a, a nervous, enlightened person, really? or an enlightened, nervous person. He thinks you could pretend to be nervous for the sake of saving others. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. And you also could be not enlightened and just nervous. You, uh, you could be <laughs> pretending to be enlightened, <laughs> and that could be making you nervous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's okay. That's right. yeah. So he didn't decide. He, didn't, he doesn't know. He doesn't decide. No. <laughs> but young, soft, open, and uncertain, I yeah. thought was. The, li was yeah, the, liber right. the beginning of the liberation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, the young, uh, the, if that guy's a reincarnation, which it sounds like he is, yeah. I have no prejudice about it. I don't know the Lama. Yeah. One of the things you'd think he jumped to as a psycho psychoanalyst, say, Safran, or psychotherapist, is that these guys are ripped away from their mothers. Yeah. Very, very young, yeah. and then they are taken care of by motherly and nice lamas, elder lamas, sometimes, yeah. and sometimes not so motherly. Mm -hmm. And uh, then maybe there are some the transitional objects are defective yeah. mm -hmm. in some way, and that may stay with them. And then, and then somehow they didn't discover mother emptiness to an adequate degree to make up for that. Yeah. If, as you are saying, that the meditation space. Yeah. It's something like a recovery of the feeling of security of a mother and so forth, which could be the case. I mean, I have some other That's thoughts about, about it, but it could yeah. be the case. But I'm saying, if you're saying that, then the, then that, uh, that space, what is it? And what does culture define it? And what is the worldview of the person? It, it, that sort of neutral space, what is the default reality, in other words, around them? If it's the default reality is nothing, that's actually comforting compared to the previous mystic thing that the default reality is being thrown in hell as a sinner. Mm -hmm. So actually, the, the, that's really why probably the nihilism became so prevalent, mm -hmm. because there was so much condemnation yes. coming from the church. Yes. And the churches, you know, synagogues, mm -hmm. churches, I think synagogues are a little more relaxed than the churches. And uh, so, you know, it's, he doesn't get into that because he's, feeling sure that because this guy has this Tibetan pedigree that he has the light. Now he may be, and he may be feigning it to mm -hmm. give this guy a greater sense of softness and, mm -hmm. and comfort and enjoying his uncertainty. Yeah. But he may not also be. Exactly. That's all. Yeah. So, so there should be some, certainly by definition, in theory, should, if he really had achieved such deep meditation, he definitely would not be nervous. Right. Mm -hmm. Definitely not. Only nervous for the sake of others. What? Nervous for the sake of others. <laughs> he might feign nervousness well, for Yeah, others. yeah, he could perhaps, if that seemed to be helpful. Right. If, for if example, was, then what would be the condition of that? In other words, is he does Mr. does that does that guy sadly he's not there. Yeah. We can't, but um, is he particularly nervous about giving public speaking? So the Lama's trying to encourage mm -hmm. him by saying, Yeah, I feel nervous, you know, something mm -hmm. like that. Or, or you know, there would have to be a context in which it would make yeah. sense to feign nervousness. Yeah. Well, because so that, so that, because it could have two, it could have two effects. One, it could, uh, it could have the one possible effect that the guy could think, well, I guess I'm cool, even though I'm nervous. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so, that, but that, could, but the other effect you could have is you could decide that there's subliminally perhaps. There's not so much reason to make a big effort to get enlightened because I'm still going to be nervous. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, that's a negative. That's effect. a negative. It loses inspiration right. to try to achieve something right. where he would have what they no, call pratibana. So they have something called pratibana. Mm -hmm. You know, pratibana you have in Pali, pratibana. <laughs> and pratibana is something that you have, for mm -hmm. example, and that is where 
you you have found comfort and and pleasure in some kind of understanding, and that you you then turned yourself into a, a vessel or a vehicle to convey that to others, mm -hmm. and you can't really feel nervous in that sense because it's not like you feel you have to make something up or something. You feel you're conveying something that you discover that is of value. Mm -hmm. So then you have that your nervousness is swept away in mm -hmm. your vesselhood, mm -hmm. yeah. and you're being such a vessel or a channel. Mm -hmm. That's called pratibhava. Oh, no, that's what, that's what pretty, the word. Mm -hmm. That's right. And pratibhava, the word pratibhava itself means a flash of insight. Mm -hmm. And pratibhava means where that insight carries you into mm -hmm. conveying it to mm -hmm. others. Mm -hmm. Nice. And then I said, Sanskrit is in Sanskrit. You're probably, I'm sure, say they're almost exactly the same. And this is the last one I'll read you before dinner. What's that? This is the last thing I'll read before dinner. Okay. Because it's six already, apparently. Uh, the last pre supper. The last pre supper. <laughs> <laughs> this is from. Um, this is from Joseph Goldstein, who, who's been uh, one of my big uh, uh, meditation teachers over the years. I met him at Naropa when I was 20 years old. And uh, I still go, where the place I go on retreat is, is with him. Um, teacher of Vipassana meditation. And so what I'm always looking for from these guys is any kind of personal something from them. Uh, rather than, uh, the teachings are great, but the they, you know, I like, I've gotten to know these people as friends because I met them when they were just starting out and I was so young. And so the personal, like really seeing like, oh, they're just, you know, they're real people struggling with their personalities and uh, uh, any pretense of enlightenment and so on is pretense. And uh, uh, somehow I find that encouraging rather than depressing um, because they're really conveying something still, something really important. Um, uh, anyway, uh, so this is one of the few places that Joseph actually uh, uh, speaks more personally than just as a Dharma teacher, although he's a Dharma mm -hmm. teacher. Um, one of the most powerful experiences, he writes, in my meditation practice occur uh, occurred quite a few years ago. I was doing a Zen session with Sasaki Roshi, a very fierce old Zen master. Oh, yeah. He expressed himself in a classic Zen mode, belligerent and demanding, and this was the first time I had done any Zen practice. The whole situation of the sashim was geared to making you uptight. <laughs> Roshi worked with the koan method. The koan is a problem the master gives you that does not have a rational answer. One of the most famous koans is, what is the sound of one hand clapping? There are many other such koan questions. In this session, I saw Roshi four times a day to give him the answer to my koan. Everything in the session is very structured, very tight, building the tension and the charge. Excuse me, because we talked about this out there earlier. Yes. I, can't, I cannot resist it. Please. Apparently, he didn't grope Joseph. <laughs> <laughs> this is the same Sasaki Roshi that I talked about earlier, yeah. who uh, was outed for his uh, predatory behavior. Yeah, not with jo or Joseph's not writing about being groped by Sasaki Roshi here. So he was a good teacher for some people. The session is structured very tight, building the tension and the charge. I went in with my answers, but each time Roshi just rang his bell to dismiss me and said, oh, very stupid. <laughs> this went on and on. Each time I would come in with my answer, he would say, it's okay, but it's not Zen. It was totally demeaning, and I was getting more and more uptight. Finally, I think he had a little compassion for me, and he gave me an easier koan. He moved me back, I guess. He asked, how do you manifest the Buddha while chanting a sutra? I understood that the principle was to go in and chant a little of a sutra or discourse. We had been doing some such sutra chanting every day. I do not think Sasaki Roshi knew, although he might have known, that this koan plugged in exactly to some very deep conditioning in me, going back to the third grade. Our singing teacher back then had said, Goldstein, just mouth the words. From then on, I've had a tremendous inhibition about singing. 
And now, here I was, having to perform in a very charged situation. I was a total wreck. In the pressure cooker of the sashim, which is held in silence except for the interviews, everything becomes magnified so much. I rehearsed and rehearsed two lines of chant, all the while getting more and more tight, more and more tense. The bell rang for the interview. I went in, I started chanting, and I messed up the entire thing. I got all the words wrong. I felt completely exposed and vulnerable and raw. And Roshi just looked at me and with great feeling said, very good. <laughs> it was a moment of, as Joseph says, heart touching heart. And it was powerful because I saw that to receive compassion, to receive love, to connect with both, takes a willingness to be open to one's vulnerability, a willingness to be exposed. That is when we can connect heart to heart. Mm -hmm. but yeah. I remember that one. Yeah. Why don't characters? He really was amazing, actually. I, I was not really his student, but I, but I encountered him a number of times. Uh -huh. Because Tai Uno, you know, the professor at Smith College, uh -huh. who passed away since then, as we just did Sasaki, uh, he used to invite him to Smith College. Uh -huh. And then uh, when we had our Institute of Buddhist Studies summer schools around the same time as in the Rope of Florida in Amherst, mm -hmm. we used to invite him a couple of times. I mean, he came a couple of times. Mm -hmm. And then I, he invited me to the seminar on the sutras one time, mm -hmm. which I enjoyed very much. And then we invited him. We had a summer school in Santa Cruz mm -hmm. with, this, with the San Francisco Zen Center. And he came and gave a talk. Yeah. So to, yeah, Gary Snyder. Mm -hmm. That's where he teased Gary Snyder uh -huh. about how he said, uh, you know, Gary, you know, Americans wouldn't like the Pure Land. And he said you could see Gary Snyder after visiting the Pure Land, writing as a great American poet, he would say, writing, I, I you should stay away from them there, Pure Lands. You know, and Tai Uno translated it very earthily. You know, he only yeah. spoke Japanese, he didn't speak English. So it's like, yeah. He said, they stay away from them Pure Lands. And I can see Gary Snyder writing a poem saying, I don't have no truck with them pure lands because there, there's no restaurants and no toilets. Because <laughs> 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 in the pure land you have, you don't you don't take coarse food. Mm. You just have energy mm. from the air, you know, samadhi, pure energy, and uh, and you so there's no restaurants and then you don't have any excretion. Mm -hmm. There's no toilets. Mm. <laughs> Gary wouldn't like them, I was saying. Gary was a little miffed about it. Oh. I mean, why he picked up? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but he did other great. He did other great. Things. His greatest moment, I think, was in uh, he was giving a lecture on the Diamond Sutra at, in Amherst at mm. Hampshire College, where we would hold oh. these summer schools. We would rent space from them. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was. Uh, I wasn't in the class really, but my class finished earlier, and they were just sort of finishing the thing. And I came in sort of toward the end of the class just to listen to it because he. He was very, very good, Roshi. And uh, he was lecturing where Kai was translating. And then there was a lady in the front row, sitting like that, like with a little table in front of her. And she had a tape recorder of the old kind, like cassette recorder. Mm -hmm. And she was bent on recording this lecture. But therefore, she was mainly fussing with the recorder all the time. And there's a lot of, I heard later this is what set him off. You know, there's a lot of clicking and clacking and <laughs> checking the tape. And so she wasn't actually listening because she was getting it on the tape, which was apparently getting to him. Because when he talks, he marches up and down. Mm. You know? so and so he had reached a certain point with the Diamond Sutra, you know, heard him saying, like, he says, like, and one, and I sort of overheard that part. It's like, well, one and one is not two, and it isn't even four, he said. And furthermore, the whole universe is the diamond, he said. And therefore, I don't need Elizabeth Taylor's big diamond, he said. But everything is a diamond, and you are my mother, he said. And he leapt at this woman and knocked over the table and the tape recorder, and she tumbled, and he tumbled, and everybody tumbled in that sector of the audience. And I, we were with this, and then and I were sponsoring the whole thing. You know, even Tyler, Tyler was a little nervous, but he was very brave, always to translate wherever stuff like that you went. 
and we were worried about you know lawsuits, injuries, you know, <laughs> he literally flung himself like a rock person at the at the end of it, especially because he wanted to annihilate that tape recorder, <laughs> and he wanted to make an impression on her that yeah. he, of make a communication to herself, you yeah. know, in the moment rather than for a tape recorder. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so that was a that was a typical Kazakh. Uh, <laughs> really. Another time, just the last one, because yeah. I don't want to go back to it. When I was at seminar on the sutras, we had an evening Q and A. I was talking about the Mahakriti Sutra, and there were two Japanese, one Jap professor from Japan and one from Harvard, giving also lectures on other sutras. And then we had a Q and A in the in this one of the evenings, you know. mm -hmm. and the and the students uh, who were some of his students and some from outside had come for this seminar on the sutras. It was called, and some of the students were really sick of this. It had been going on for three or two three days by then. And they were really fed up, you know, they hit students. So they got up and they asked me, they said, well, Professor Thurman, like, it's great, the people are going to sutra, and emptiness, and so and so forth, and blah, blah. I said, but what our question is, why bother with all these words? And why aren't you down with us, you and other professors down with us in the zendo, and why aren't we meditating <laughs> instead? So I started to answer something, you know, and he says, he wants to get up. Oh, Nope, I, I, I invited you here. I'm going to answer this question. And so Uno comes forward to translate for him. Because Uno was also there. And then he says, you guys remind me of a bunch of chickens <laughs> sitting around on round stones, keeping them warm and waiting for them to hatch. <laughs> and therefore you're very frustrated and irritable. I know. And the only time you feel cheery is when the rooster comes by <laughs> and makes some crowing noises. And then he starts crowing like a rooster walking up and down in front of the whole row of students, like 30, 40 of them. <laughs> and the other guy like that. So then he sort of little Then one of them gets up and then he says, Now the stone that you're sitting on is your ignorance. Mm -hmm. And your ignorance will never hatch, no matter how much you meditate, into a chicken, another chicken. <laughs> and so I invited these professors here to try to educate you a little bit, he said. Mm -hmm. And you have to listen. You know? so, <laughs> so then one of them, they were ready for him, you know. So then one of them gets up and says, well, Roshi, if we're so ignorant, he said, why did you make some of us Osho? Mm -hmm. You know, which is like an instructor you know, mm -hmm. among the students, like a head instructor. And he said, well, he said, because I'm very kind to you. He said. <laughs> and I noted that ignorant Americans love to be taught by other ignorant. <laughs> <laughs> and so just to show you that I mean business in that regard, I'm going to go over and sit down at this table when these lectures are completed. And I will sign up anyone, even people from the outside, they can be Osho. <laughs> Any of you, I'll give you the degree of Osho, he said. <laughs> and they quieted down and they listened to the lecture. But it was really an immoral moment. <laughs> and for me it was very immoral because in those days, that was yeah. in the 70s, mm -hmm. the, 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 the sort of anti-learning thing in yeah. the Buddhist community was, very, was huge. Yeah. It was like, you mentioned the library. Yeah. Jack Jack told my told Nina once. Yeah. yeah, that's the library, but we don't allow anybody to go in there. Yeah. 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 So it's like don't learn anything because learn that's why they trained that's what I was saying the other day, they translated as training. Mm -hmm. Because all of these all of us are over educated. You know, we went like sixteen years to school and then graduate degrees and everything. And after all that education, we're all still miserable, <laughs> anxious, <laughs> nervous, whatever. So we assume that no further, but we think we're highly educated. So there'll, no, there'll be no need of further education, but we're dying to be trained, mm -hmm. uh, not to be nervous. You know? We think it's like a training, but actually, it's simply we're, we're properly educated. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, uh, quite, you know. Yeah. Like, a, uh, like I tried it at Columbia and at Amherst at different times. A few times I was tempted, I got carried away, and I tried to let the students meditate for even like eight minutes in class. And in all cases it created like an uproar. Mm -hmm. You know, introducing religion mm -hmm. into a class, you know. It was nonsense, nothing to do with religion. It's like 
be aware of your body and whatever. You know what I mean? It was very elementary mm -hmm. type of thing. But it's created like mm -hmm. some student mentioned Complain. it to some parent mm -hmm. and it was called the right. dean and everybody got all freaked out. Because the whole, the whole idea is that you're not trying to change anybody's mind, you're just giving them more information so they can go out and go to Wall Street and make money and make donations back to the college. That's the purpose. That's the purpose, That's the purpose of it. It's like, a, it's like part of the factory, you know, basically, unfortunately. So that people are not educated how to master and control and change actually the instrument with which they learn and so forth. Anyway. So how do we get properly Anyway, I think we, we got to get dinner. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank we'll you. Come back. By the way, well, I think we'll come I, back. I really like your space, meditation space, and the mother and the whole thing. Yeah.